Okay. Ready to begin? Okay, fantastic. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving holiday and are doing well and being safe and practicing all the safe protocols, um, mm -hmm. as well as looking forward to an up the upcoming holiday, Christmas. And for those who celebrate Hanukkah, happy, happy Hanukkah. Today's webinar will host and celebrate women of exemplary business acumen and visionaries who will share their experiences, professional challenges, strategies, victories that have inspired so many of us. As we finalize the year of 2020 and look forward to the year of the woman for 2021, we thought it best to end on a high note and bring you a league of extraordinary women in commercial real estate, which is our topic for today's programming. But before we begin, let us get some housekeeping rules as we always do out the way so that this way we can begin the program on schedule and end on schedule. The webinar is being recorded, so hopefully no one objects. Um, for those who cannot join us, they can recapture the webinar via our HGR website 24 to 48 hours after this recording. <laughs> the chat feature has been disabled. You will, however, be able to ask questions using the Q&A feature, which will remain active during the webinar and will be monitored by Gary Connolly. So at the end of our program, our guest moderator, John Barrett, will field any additional questions from our audience and answers from our guest panelists. As always, we like to extend our thanks and appreciation to our HGAR CEO, Richard Haggerty, our HGAR CID President and Senior Vice President and Managing Director of RM Friedland, John Barrett, as well as agreeing, agreeing to serve as guest moderator for today's program. Our current HGAR President, Gail Fatizi, and incoming President-elect, Crystal Hawkins Siska, and my co-chair, Dorothy Botso, for all their continued support and encouragement for these workshops. Um, we also like to give a special thank you to our sponsor today, uh, uh, Robert Withers, uh, President and CEO of M1 Capital Corp. Robert is a respected real estate finance professional and has a successful 30-year track record of providing creative solutions for commercial real estate industry clients. A leader in real estate financing for the past two decades, M1 Capital Corp is based in White Plains, New York. M1 Capital Corp specializes in acquisitions, refinancing, outstanding loans, restructuring current debt, and delivering smart, effective solutions through a variety of loan options, including commercial, hard money, SBA 504 and 7A programs, as well as spec construction financing, multifamily and commercial debt workouts. Robin also authors a popular blog, it's called The Equity Strategist, in which he explores aspects of the real estate finance industry. He also serves as an HGAR real estate finance instructor and guest columnist and is a board member at Mount St. Michael Academy. He was also a former board member of both the Boys and the Girls Clubs of New York and Partnership for a Better Westchester. Robert, we'd like to thank you. You want to say a few words, Robert? Good morning. Good morning, Teresa. Thank you so much. I couldn't have done a better job of introducing myself. I appreciate it. First of all, to everybody, uh, happy holidays. Um, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy. And um, I wish I could be... Um, in a little setting right now to address you all. I'm sitting in, I'm actually driving out east to an appointment uh, that was made prior uh, to this commitment. So um, I wanted just to really just to uh, bounce in, say hello, uh, thank Teresa for asking me to sponsor John, who I've worked with in the past, um, great moderator and uh, wish all the panelists today a great uh, presentation. And um, I'm available for any questions. Um, I don't know, how, I'll stay on for as long as I possibly can. I don't know how the service is out here in the Hamptons uh, as I get farther out east, uh, but uh, I wish you a great presentation today. My information is made available through Hagar. And again, have a great presentation. Robert, thank you so much. We want you to drive safely, though. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you will. Yes, I'm, do I'm doing that. Thank <laughs> okay. you. You're welcome. Um, so now we'll move on to the introduction of our, pa our guest panelists. First up, 
She is no stranger to the HGAR family. She's usually and typically have served as a moderator on a lot of our um, workshop series for women in commercial. We'd like to welcome Patricia Valenti. She is the executive managing director of Newmark Knight and Frank. Patricia specializes in securing space for many of the region's major financial service organizations, including JP Morgan Chase, Mac Capital Partners, Resource Mortgage Banking, Landau, and more. She has had many achievements in including the Women Making an Impact Award, the Leo Jaffe Distinguished Service Award, the CoStar Power Broker Award for Westchester and Fairfield Markets, and the Broker Hall of Fame Award for the largest deals completed. Please welcome Patricia Valenti. Next up, we have Diana Boutros. She's the Ex Executive Vice President of Cushman and Wakefield. Diana joined Cushman and Wakefield in November of 2015, bringing with her 20 years of experience in the real estate industry. Prior to working with Cushman and Wakefield, she was the executive vice president at Winnick Realty Group for 15 years. Diana has led Murray Hield Properties, TriStar Properties, and Aegis Properties, both in leasing and investment sales. Diana has represented a significant number of sales and leasing transactions, including 1 East 42nd Street to the government of Greece and the sale of the UGA building at 400 West 59th Street, among others. Prior to her real estate career, Diana worked for Dr. Henry A. Kissinger, former Secretary of State, as an executive director in his New York-based consulting company. Some of her most notable landlord clients have included Crown Acquisitions, Madison International Realty, Grainstone Property Development, Jeb Realty, Wharton Properties, the Durs organizations, to name a few. Diana also serves on the Repney Commercial Committees in helping to publicize the New York City markets. Please, let's welcome Diana Boutros. Next up, we have Linda Fogey, Senior Vice President of Turner and Townsend, the New York City office. Linda is a Senior Vice President and Leader of the Turner and Townsend, New York office. Linda's initial focus will be working with New York team on their real estate segment growth strategy armed with a bachelor's degree in architecture and real estate development from MIT. Linda joins Turner and Townsend from Wells Fargo, where she served as the vice president of corporate real estate. She was responsible for Wells Fargo's Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions, leading a large team of professionals prior to delivering real estate transactions and capital project delivery. Prior to Wells Fargo, Linda was the director of project management in CBRE's Global Co Corporate Services Group and led its Philadelphia market. An architect by trade, one of Linda's most notable projects was her involvement at the iconic 30 Hudson Yards building in New York City. Linda's best advice, which I personally hold dear, speak truth because it affects your ability to teach, mentor, and learn. Welcome, Linda Fogey. And our last guest panelist is Carolyn Garante, Senior Project Manager of Acom Tishman. Carolyn is a New York City licensed architect and project management project manager at Tishman Construction and a lecturer for the Master of Science in Construction Administration at Columbia University. Carolyn is currently teaching a master's course in advanced project management. Carolyn specializes in managing high-risk projects as they relate to, to schedule and budget. Her primary focus on, is on the architectural details, and she works closely with the design team and field trades to troubleshoot field issues as they arise and make design decisions where required. Carolyn has managed architectural work on several iconic superstructures in New York City, including One World Trade Center, Manhattan's West Northeast Tower Lobby, and currently Vanderbilt's Observation Deck. Carolyn graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with a bachelor's degree in architecture and a master's of science in architecture, engineering, and construction management. Carolyn's international work experience includes designing a corporate pavilion for the 2010 World Expo in Shanghai, China. Thank you and welcome Carolyn Garanti. And last up, but not least, John Barrett we are all familiar with as the president of the eight of our HGR commercial and investment division. He's also a senior vice president and managing director of investment sales at RM Freeland. John began his brokerage career at, at Massey, not, I, I can't pronounce that last name, but not to, which was known as Cushman and Wakefield, where he led the top ranked firm's expansion into Westchester County. He began working for RM Freeland in 2018. John specializes in the sale of income producing assets of all types, multifamily, retail, office, development sites, and industrial in Westchester County and Fairfair counties. 
Over the course of his career, he has evaluated and marketed over $1 billion worth of commercial real estate. John serves as the president of the Commercial Investment Division at here at the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors and is also a member of the board. He is a member of the Building and Realties Institute Apartment Owners Advisory Council, and he has served on the loan committee of the Community Capital Resources, a not-for-profit community development financial institution based in Westchester. John is also on the board of the ARC of Westchester and chairs the membership, public relations, and marketing committees. We'd like to thank you all. John, the floor is yours. Let's begin the program. Thank you, Teresa. And we promise to get all our panelists and guests out shortly after 11 a.m. today. So let's get right to it. Uh, thank you all for participating today. Teresa, thank you for the invitation to moderate. Um, first question out there would be, uh, for many people, real estate might not be their first career. People enter re the real estate field sometimes as a second career. Um, what about the commercial real estate industry attracted you in the first place? And did you have a mentor who guided you into the field? And I'll throw it out, anyone who wants to tackle it first, but I'd like to hear from all four of you on that question. I'll take it. Sure. Sure. So how, how I started uh, this business is a little backwards. Um, I had friends who owned a commercial real estate company in the city. And, you know, they were the principals and, you know, my personality is one that I could not sit behind a desk all day. And, you know, I'd go to their offices, they'd tell me about all their deals and, you know, I watched who had a driver, who was doing this and that. And I said, gee, I want to do that too. So honestly, I just jumped in without really knowing. Uh, the reason why I got into commercial, I started out in residential for two months and it was a very unpleasant experience uh, back in the day. You know, they'd give me the wrong keys and it was just, you know, I was creating a career. I wasn't doing this to fill in a gap of time. And that, that transition for me was just very natural to go into the commercial side. I'll piggyback off that, Patricia. I think on the construction end, um, working more on the, with commercial construction and then with the, with sort of, um, an overpass through into commercial real estate. I wouldn't say I work directly with commercial real estate, but in terms of dealing with commercial real estate, you know, um, representatives, there's a cross and a liaison there. I started out, you know, thinking that I was going to design buildings and um, becoming an architect, and now I'm in that position where we build. And um, I act specifically as a liaison to the client who who is um, holding investors conferences frequently. Um, we're dealing with other consultants frequently. So there's there's such a huge cross and a bridge between the fields of uh, construction, real estate, and also um, and also architecture and design that you can really, if you're looking to get into the business, you can start somewhere and see where you evolve in your own journey and see where it takes you. And ultimately you might, you might find something that is your niche specifically, and then find that, you know, later on, you're going to cross paths with what you originally thought you were going to be doing in the, in the first place. I, um, also, next, I completely resonate with Carolyn's comments. I, like Carolyn, I am an architect, and so I started my career designing buildings. But then, um, you know, as the economy was going down one year, uh, construction was still booming and architecture was slow, and I was sort of asked to move into construction management. And I found that it was a much better, better fit for my personality. To Patricia's point, architecture for me was a little bit more head down, whereas project management was a lot more about interfacing and interacting. It was about people, which is sort of a strong suit for me and so I kind of found that I liked it and then as I evolved from CBRE um, and then to other companies in Wells Fargo I figured out that I also um, really what I liked about it was kind of leading and inspiring people and so I'm more in a management seat at this point you know, I still get to touch architecture and construction a little because that's what we do um, but mostly my role is about helping other people to develop in their careers helping clients to make sure they're getting what they need and um, kind of bridging the gap and being a great communicator so um, I agree you just kind of drift along in your career that's not a good way to say it but um, I'll talk later about this career lattice where you kind of go sideways sometimes you go up sometimes you go in different directions but it's all about kind of getting yourself on the journey to figuring out you know how to do something that you really enjoy so I can speak next. Um, I can say I have a little bit of each one of you ladies. And I started out in 
actually event planning for a national association of insurance agents. Um, and I took a little hiatus from that job because I'd been traveling year after year for like five years all over the world. And I just wanted to settle somewhere. So I was dating this fellow whose family owned several buildings and they had no one to set up their business for them. Uh, so they asked me to join them and just set up their business and organize their, re their real estate. It was leasing sales, investment management um, and managing the properties. Uh, so I did that for three years. And then after a little while of doing that and, and, and I decided I wanted to go into Manhattan and I wanted to do retail real estate. And so that's where my journey started. I love the creative balance of, of the investments and changing the landscapes of markets and neighborhoods. And that to me was very exciting because I, at that time we were seeing the rollouts of all these new national brands that were coming in and they were super innovative. And I just thought this is this very interesting field. Um, and then I learned that the, it wasn't just bringing someone to space and you know showing houses. It was really creating marketing and strategies and understanding the business that they're bringing to the table and who their customers are. So that my journey has been very organic in that, in terms of that. When I got to Cushman and Wakefield, that's where I realized how much more there was, and how, much, how many people and how many service lines they had that could help and support those tenants that were coming into these markets. So that's where my journey went. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I know that Teresa read all of your bios, but can you tell us a little bit about your specialty in commercial real estate, what you do, what a typical day or a typical week is like in your schedule? Why don't we go in reverse order? Can Diana, you want to start with that one? Sure. Um, I don't know that there is a typical day in our business, <laughs> <laughs> but I will do my best. I will tell you that most of the day is at this time, pre-pandemic, it was more managing every deal that was out there and working with different clients, both on the landlord and tenant side, um, and executing the strategies of re-tenanting malls and re-tenanting buildings, and on the strategy for growing tenants, looking into new markets, driving markets, meeting, uh, doing focus groups with with um, with um, customers and you know, sort of analyzing where do we go from here? What is our next view? I do a lot of work with affordable housing. I work for three of the biggest affordable housing developers in the city of New York. So I would get in a car in a minute's notice and just drive new markets in different areas of the city. I work in all five boroughs. Um, so that's that was always quite interesting for me. And plus I manage several brokers who work on these properties with me to re-tenant and bring in new tenants. Um, and there have been so many new service lines and so many new businesses, uh, especially in the medical field that have come up. There's the schools had grown exponentially. So it was very interesting how things were twisting and turning. Um, and but now that the pandemic took place, we are focusing more on managing the tenants that are in place, keeping their businesses growing and deferring some of the monies that they owe and their rents and just supporting them in figuring out how to get their business out into the street and not inside because we weren't allowed to have customers inside the building. So that's pretty much what my day is. It's a lot of balancing and a lot of managing and a lot of building confidence on both sides of the table with the landlords, the tenants and the customers. With your relationships with tenants and landlords, can you speak to what rent collections look like in your market? So um, I represent a large portfolio, uh, Madison International Realty, which was the former Forest City portfolio, just two and a half million square feet of retail in five boroughs. Um, some of the tenants paid the rent straight through the pandemic and also paid their, um, their employees. Um, that was very difficult for them. Some of the other tenants uh, paid, they missed like three months rent, I would say, just the time that was completely closed and you couldn't get into any of these malls and even the exterior stores with, with access weren't allowed to open anyway. Um, those tenants, uh, some of them paid partial rent, some of them just paid the extras. And I think this is what went on in a lot of the stores in the city. 
um, that were not in malls. And what we did was we just organized uh, A, Bs and Cs. And we started deferring rent and abating rent. We gave each one a package to do that. Some of them were not able to meet those packages. So we made it, we just kept adjusting it until they were able to meet whatever their needs were. And some of the rent was pushed way far. We, we allowed them to pay over 18 months, whatever few months that they had that we deferred. So we forgave, we deferred, and we also gave them time. And we also restructured the situation where they weren't allowed to have more than two or three people inside the mall. We created exterior access, delivery stations, and we just did everything we possibly could to support their businesses so that they didn't go out of business. It's a mutual arrangement with, with each right. side. If they go, everyone goes. Right. Uh, so I'll go next. So um, so in my role, I um, Turner and Townsend is a professional services firm. And so what we um, offer is uh, project management and cost management and so, certain other um, consulting services to um, other businesses. So we're a business to business and a consultant type firm. Um, and in fact, when I was at Wells Fargo, Turner Townsend was a vendor of mine and I was a client of theirs. Um, and I hired them to, to look after my construction projects to hire the architects and oversee them and hire the co contractors and oversee them. Um, and so when I shifted to this role, this is basically what we do for a lot of other clients, mostly corporate occupiers, but we work for other clients too, like the NCA and JFK and New York Air Force. Um, but a lot of the companies that have office buildings in and around New York, it sounds quite geographic, but we have people working all over the country um, in sectors like hospitality, sports, leisure, stadiums, we do all those types of things. So a lot of the professionals that work with me are construction project managers, a lot of them have backgrounds in architecture and engineer and engineering. And so what I do on a typical day as the head of the New York office is, um, it really is about running a full business. And so my day is about the art of the check-in and it's an incredibly fast paced role. And it's every day I need to fly at 35,000 feet and I need to be careful not to dip down too far into the weeds. And so a lot of my job is about trust, a lot about trusting and empowering my leaders, my directors in the mm -hmm. business that are running the business for me. I need to pop into different clients' accounts. I check in with clients to make sure they're feeling okay. I check in with my leaders. I try to check in throughout all the different levels of the organization. And so really all I'm doing in those check-ins is I'm listening, I'm trying to pick out the problems, I'm trying to spot a problem, I'm offering guidance, I'm coaching, I'm being strategic and helping to also think ahead a few months of wherever my people are thinking or try to think ahead of whatever our clients are thinking and needing as well. So I really do enjoy the pace of it because I like fast pace, it works for me. It works for New York too. Um, and then there's <laughs> our business is quite global. So I spend a good bit of my time also trying to understand, I spend a lot of time researching the markets, understanding what's happening in the markets, what's happening with rents, what's happening with um, concessions, what's happening with landlords, investors, tenants, um, and kind of, I watch the stock market so that I could be well-informed when I'm sort of helping right. to guide and make decisions. So that's kind of a typical day for me. Fantastic. I'm busy. <laughs> very. <laughs> very fast space. <laughs> So I guess similar to what Linda was saying, I um, my role as a senior project manager with Acom Tishman, um, I'm more responsible for one particular job as opposed to many jobs. So right now I'm working on one Vanderbilt's uh, observation deck. And uh, so my role is really to work with a team and collaborate with a team in-house um, of other construction managers and watch the construction um, pretty much from start to finish. Uh, work with the design team, the architects and the client and come up with a solution um, to how they want this uh, observation deck to look. And then right now we're in the, we just wrapped up procurement. Right now we're in the process of actually building. So um, a couple of months ago, my job was mostly in the office working with the client directly. Now I'm pretty much in the field, I'd say two to three days out of the week working with my super. So I'll like be wearing the hard hat and the boots and everything. Um, and then just really getting into the details, starting to look at the drawings and, and interpret to the trades. Um, being that I'm an architect, I can understand certain things without, without having to go through the whole RFI process and just it streamlines the process with that knowledge to help the field. Um, also come up and really work and work and deliver the project in a more timely fashion. Um, 
at the same time, I try to mentor my team as well. And just uh, being that I've had uh, the opportunity with a competition to work on so many projects, I try to mentor our younger uh, team members to, you know, take initiative and also do the same thing, be very thorough about our reports, uh, follow up with the owner. I give them a chance to speak in some of our owners meetings so that they can interface properly the, the same way. And then, you know, moving forward as our job progresses, I'll be more in the field every day. So it's, a, it's really a, a moving target as the job progresses. And every job is a little different, um, but I, I do love it because it is it is so uh, it is such a variable on on a day to day on what we'd be doing. Um, and then you know, second to that, I, I do uh, I do teach courses at Columbia University, which is also very nice because we get to also work with other students who are coming from different walks of life. Some are in the field, some are out of field, some are engineers, architects, and it's nice to be able to uh, share those experiences and also. Um, at, like as leaders of today come up with new solutions and new proposals on how we can improve the system um, as it relates to construction and real estate. Great. Okay. Am I next? Yes, you are. Okay, so my day, you know, is uh, a little different um, because I don't sleep that much. Sometimes I wake up, I start my day like 2, 3 a.m. and I start shooting off emails and text messages. Uh, my assistant is working remotely. She and I get along very well. And it scares me when she answers me at 3.30. Um, so with that being said, um, I get up very early in the morning and I probably start with an hour and a half of answering emails and sending emails, writing proposals, um, trying to connect with people early. And then I jump on the Peloton because I feel that no matter what industry you're in, you need to have a clear mind and whether or not you, you have a Peloton or a treadmill or you go outside and walk, I think you need clarity. And then you start your day and you approach everything, you know, with a whole different set of tools. Uh, my day comprises of speaking with landlords, holding landlords' hands for the agency business I do, um, speaking with clients, negotiating, working with associates of partners of mine in different offices, showing space, doing virtual tours. I honestly can't, I don't have enough time in the day now. I, I, I'm very happy to say that, but like today, I am like jam packed, writing proposals, negotiating, holding people's hands, helping landlords collect some rent. Um, I think you just need to, you know, be resourceful and I'm involved with not-for-profit. Um, uh, groups. Uh, last week, the March of Dimes had their real estate event. We normally, we'd have 700 people in a room. We'd make 700000 We did our first virtual. We made $300,000. Um, and that was from 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. So a lot of hard work for my committee. Um, I'm also the vice president of my country club. So that pulls me in another direction. But, you know, I love the energy. Um, that's basically what keeps me going. So my day can be any of the above. Gotcha. And that March of Dimes Breakfast is an excellent event every year. And I know you've chaired it for many, many years, Patty. Thank I you think since I started walking, I think since I started walking. Right. <laughs> okay. So it looks like we're rounding the corner on, on COVID. It's, it's going to you know, take some time to get through the next few months as hospitalizations and uh, increase and hopefully the vaccine is effective. But let's just say a year from now, um, COVID is a non-factor in our business. What is your short to medium term view of the marketplace post COVID world? Um, where are we three years down the road or five years down the road? John, I'll start with that one. Um, I think it's not, like with certain things, you know, there's that old saying that says that if it doesn't break you, it makes you stronger. I think with this um, tough year that everybody has had financially, some people personally, and um, a lot of the challenges that came in with it, we've all learned a lot about ourselves and also about our businesses and how um, things can be can change and be better. Um, I think when we come back into the normal day to day after a post COVID, I think there's going to be a lot of acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, we potentially could do things differently than how they were being done. Maybe, um, maybe from a, from a real estate point of view, 
uh, sure, maybe some people work more from home, but maybe there's a different office setup that can be offered as well. Maybe there's a potential to uh, improve the way the office layout works and, and that does something for business as well. Um, and also even a hybrid now of thinking of working virtually and in person. I mean, there's just so many, so many different ways um, of working that we really haven't untapped and also living as well, just at, from a residential point of view. Um, I, think, I think it's gonna be different, but I, I think hopefully um, everyone that has been experiencing this can come back to work a year later pretty much and, and offer some pretty in, um, inventive solutions on how to improve the market. Um, and I think just having, I don't want to say it, it's a year off because it's been a really tough year and everyone's been working, but it's been a different type of year. So I think it's been a year of learning. And I think the creativity that's going to come out of all of this is really going to skyrocket. I think we're going to see a lot of really interesting ideas on um, real estate in the market and also even in construction as well. And I, I, um, I love Carolyn's comments. I um, completely agree with the learning aspect. And then just to tag on to that so from a real estate perspective, I do think that um, in a year, in two years, three years, I do think from a commercial real estate perspective that there will still be a place for office and office will be a place. Um, so it will require, as Carolyn talked about, the design to be kind of place making so that it's something that attracts people into the space. I think while we learned that people could be quite productive from home and work from home and get a lot of things done, we also learned that it's very difficult to do certain things from home. You know, I hear companies talk a lot about um, onboarding new employees, um, ingraining new people into the culture. Some of these things are very challenging to do remotely, purely remotely. And so I think we may start to see a combination of um, instead of sort of only a central business district, businesses may spread out a little bit and have their commercial, their big office in the city, but they might have some satellite offices in some of the suburbs that are a little bit easier for people to get to. Um, but I do think there will still be a place for the office uh, kind of once we're past this. Diana or Patty, do you want to add anything to that? Sure. I mean, what, what, how I see it is, I think there's, a, there's going to be a lot of reevaluating being done. I think it's being done now. Um, I think companies for the sake of doing things like they always did, you know, had an abundance of space and, and everyone just functioned the way they functioned forever. I think now there's going to be a combination of work at home, come to the office, but there's no substitution for collaboration and sharing of ideas and just brainstorming. There's just no way you can convey everything across Zoom. And I think the companies that bring in younger folks who need to help shape their careers, they're just floundering. So I think that once COVID settles, I think you're gonna see a stronger return to the workplace, but I feel strongly that you will see more flexibility from the employers in reference to some folks who wanna still work at home. Do you see anything, Patty, based on age? Uh, I've heard people say that, you know, people with gray hair are never going back to the office, that they, they're so far along in their careers that they don't need to interact so much that they can do their job from home, but that the younger generation, you know, and, and the mid-generation, if you will, um, need to be in the office. Listen, you know what? I think, I think people are kidding themselves. You know, gray hair or no gray hair. Um, no one knows all the answers. And even though we're, we may be more experienced, you still need to broaden, you know, your, your scope. And you just, I think you can't hide. I'm very sensitive to the fact if you have an underlying condition or a family member, but I think people are starting to hold on to that as a crutch now, because it's like, you feel safe. You don't want to go out. You don't want to expand your horizons. I think it's healthier all of us to get back to work for those who may not be self-starters because you can really drift in this environment and you can drift to a point where you may not want to return. I agree. I with think you. it's a really um, important point that Patty makes because um, also how do you expect that the company will carry on if you know a lot of what happens when people are together in the office is that the younger people are learning from the more experienced people and if only the younger people are coming in how are the more senior people passing on the knowledge the institutional knowledge the experience to the younger people if they're if they're not going to ever be there so I think Patty makes a, a really good point in order for your company to go on um, you do need to kind of contribute back by just your presence I think. 
And I think in most of these companies, a lot of the management teams have had to pivot to attract people to come back to the office and make them feel comfortable being in the office and keep conversations and keep contact with everyone on their teams and in the company just to make them understand that the ship has not been abandoned. We're still here. Your office is still here. Your peers are still here. Um, I do believe, Patty, that a lot of people have gone to retirement, that, but I think those same people may have been thinking about it already. And I think that's just sort of pushed the envelope because they felt like I've done as much as I've really wanted to do. And that was a place for me to go every day out of habit. But now that things have shifted, I think they have new habits and they've learned maybe more time with their family or more leisure time is more valuable to them at this stage of their life. But I also see some of the gray hair like myself who can't wait to come back to the office and, and collaborate, as you said, and work and go to lunches and dinners and just walk around the city and be comfortable mm -hmm. with that. Diana, you know, you make a good point too. I think uh, one thing that came out of all of this is the appreciation too for family and, and time at home. Us, uh, I don't know if everyone here is from New York, but the New Yorkers for sure, uh, to a point really needed to slow down a little bit and really just uh, take a breather. And it was it was kind of refreshing at the same time to be able to be home, spend a little time with your family, spend some time with the people that you love and also care about them, um, show that you care about them. And then, and then you know, I have the luxury of having being able to go back to work every day. I'm, I'm at work pretty much every day. Um, but I could see how it could get, you know, you want to, you want to have something somewhere to go. That's why I think like everything that's happened, there's always the positives and the negatives. On the bright side, a lot of people did get a chance to really just uh, watch their kids grow, you know, and spend time with their families. And those are like the important things. That's why sometimes you, you, you um, What's the saying? You work to live. You don't live to work all the time. So it's a little bit of a. It's a little bit of, of um. I guess a mix. It forced a new balance. It forced a different balance, and now a lot of us have become more aware and more comfortable. And I think to what you just said, spending more time with these little children and not shifting them out to a school and then a daycare has meant a lot. And the adjustment in the beginning, I remember hearing from a lot of my clients, my kids are driving me crazy. And now, you know, everyone's sort of folded into a balance and the kids are learning at home remotely. They're more comfortable with it. The parents are more comfortable. We all get to work. And I, you know, I think that that was much needed, in, especially in the New York market. We, we just run and keep pushing ourselves and it's great, but we're all overachievers. And then the end of the day, we're still getting to the same place anyway. It's just how we get there now. I've been back in the office since June and we're in um, Harrison, New York. So we're in the suburbs. So we don't have the density that you have, Diana and, and the other panelists who are in the city. So it's been easier for us to come back because we're not dealing with mass transit. But from a brokerage perspective, we feed off the energy of everybody else in the office. Yes, collaboration, but it's also the energy of making the calls, getting the deals done. Um, so I, I understand what you're all saying here, but I think the biggest loser here is gonna be our pets. Our pets have gotten used to us home for 10 months. I don't know what my dog is gonna do when no one's home, great. <laughs> all right. Um, how would you describe the current state of the market uh, with with COVID, uh, post COVID? Um, you know, it, it, I've heard good things about retail vacancies in New York City because it's allowing some companies who could never afford the rent, who are national companies but didn't necessarily have a Manhattan presence, it's allowing them to enter the market because of the discount to uh, rent. So, uh, Diana, do you want to start out with that one? Or Pivot off that point, state of the market, where, where it is in your world. So um, it's interesting because there were so many digital brands that were afraid to do the brick and mortar. And I think this landscape has changed that and it's given them the ability to come in to different markets and maybe to do a pop-up here and there and see how their brands relate on a um, in-store experience. I think a lot of the online experience is shifting now and I do think that the shift in rents is helping this. And I think that landlords are much more open to not having space empty. So that has really shifted the whole retail market in all parts of the city, both 
than in the boroughs and in Manhattan. Um, it's really not healthy for people to see so many dark storefronts. Um, there are a lot of new tenants that are coming into the market and they're negotiating some very aggressive deals. But I think the understanding and I've been experiencing the understanding is, okay, so the first few years, it may be a little light on the rent, but as those sales start to grow and continue to grow and the comfort level continues, then there's an adjustment in those rents and say 24 to 36 months out. So I think that it's provided um, a whole new perspective for both sides. As we said, as Carolyn said, there's, a, there's an eye opening here. Um, and it can't be just uh, the LVMHs and the gaps and the national brands. It's time for those local brands. These are the times mm. when the local brands grow the most. It happened in 2008 and it's happening now. Um, unfortunately, the banks are the ones that are struggling um, because the defeasance is gonna start and a lot of these investments that investors that took loans out and refinanced mm. such high numbers, they're not gonna be able to pay those loans. So there's a lot of adjusting, but I think as far as the retail landscape, I think we're gonna see a lot of new innovative tenants. As I said, there's quite a lot of medical, um, there's healthcare, there's home care, there's children, there's all kinds of new schools. So I think that, um, you know, and for example, like something like Staples, which was sort of struggling before the pandemic and they were downsizing and closing stores, they became a daily needs tenant. Now that everyone's working at home and things have adjusted, they need paper, they need ink. So these stores have survived and they've bounced back. And there are a number of them like that, that really pre-pandemic were in trouble and now they've shifted in the market. So it's, it's kind of an interesting time. And I think that it's going to be again, an exciting time, um, but I don't think it's gonna be crazy like it was before everyone struggling to get their flagship on Fifth Avenue, I think all of that changed. I do see Fifth Avenue coming back. Um, I don't see it going back to the discount road that it was 30 years ago, but I think they're, these, these tenants are putting their toe in the water and I think they're taking their risk and they know that in two, three years, this will be back. We survived 9-11, we survived 2008. These are all in the rear view mirror and they are huge learning experiences. Patty, it used to be that a 10-year lease was the norm for office space or for retailers. Uh, do you see reticence on the part of tenants to sign long-term leases? You know, it, it depends on the it depends on the group and their long-term vision. Um, I just got done signing a 25,000 square foot deal, which is unheard of, with a law firm. And before COVID, we were about to sign, and then COVID stop, stopped. Long and short is we got we got it over the goal line. But so my conversation with them was, you've been in business 30 years. You're not going away. When COVID stops, you will already have negotiated a tremendous deal with great value, right? That your younger partners will inherit. So it depends on the group's vision. Okay, we've done a lot of touchdown deals with groups out of the city and they want to test the waters. So they do like, they want to do a year, they want to do two years, they want to do three. And when, and a few of them have moved in since May and they're asking confidentially to get extensions. So, you know, I, I think there is hesitation. Um, I've contacted some folks for renewals who I represent, tenant rep, and they're unclear as to how they want to proceed. I, um, I would I would echo that for I'll talk to the corporate occupier sector It's a, a big part of our business here is the big corporates. And um, I'm seeing also what we're seeing is that in this pandemic, there actually were certain sectors that are winners out of this and some were losers, but some are winners like, for example, technology sector, like the zooms like the Google's people were at home, they needed more of those uh, services. And some have, uh, and, and also in addition to tech is media, like the Netflixes, like some of the um, Viacom channels that are here in New York. Um, and so those companies are, what we saw in the beginning in March and April was there was a full stop because they were uncertain about what would happen with office, what would happen with people coming back to work, would people ever return? And so we did see a slowdown, but kind of over the summer, 
um, people started to kind of, there was a thawing, if you will, from my view in the markets and corporate occupier sector where people started to realize, okay, at some point something is going to happen and we'll need to make some sort of decisions. And so while people were still, to Patricia's point, hesitant to enter into a 10 year lease term, um, we have seen activity started to pick up. And now we're also seeing the corporates start, start to take note um, the tech companies were some of the first to say, okay, you can work at home until next July or some said forever, but they also are in New York signing the biggest lease deals that are happening right now. So there's something about it. They're getting great deals from what we hear. Um, and so I do think that there will be kind of a comeback of this, but I think for 2021, um, all indicators are that it'll be a fairly sluggish, you know, but then beyond that, we think we'll start to see it um, really come back to life. But we do think that when it comes back, it's going to happen much quicker than people think, not sooner, but in a very fast way. Like once people get on board with this, it's just going to take off. And so we're trying to make sure in our businesses that we're positioned to support that. Okay. Can I just say one other thing? Um, what we're seeing in, in Connecticut, um, mostly Greenwich, there's almost a war over these spaces, these office spaces. The class A spaces are just being absorbed by the walk to the train. And you're talking about 90, $95 rents and they're not shying away. And we're seeing a lot of big brand retailers out of New York. Uh, Montclair did a pop-up, Stubbs and Wooten did a pop-up. The Real Real is landing. You know, we all know Barney's is gonna be going into under Saks's umbrella. So, you know, there's a lot of testing of the waters as residential, as, uh, as you know, residents have relocated to Westchester and Connecticut, these retailers want to, the brands want to follow their client, their customer. So I think we're going to see a lot of uh, interesting things go on. I'd agree. There's also a residential shift. <clears throat> I noticed that as well. Um, a lot of people, now that they've been home for almost a year, have been now looking at their house differently and looking to um, do additions and do uh, new construction on their houses. So I think from a residential point of view, it's also the climate is changing. Um, and from a construction uh, point of view in the city, um, you know, work really didn't slow down so much for some of the big jobs in the city. I think that uh, there's always going to be clients that want their jobs to get done and there's always going to be space to fill and uh, deadlines to meet. So that's the benefit there. I wouldn't say it's at its high point, um, but I do think like Linda said, there's gonna be a point where then you don't, it's just gonna skyrocket and everything's just gonna go back to that New York fast paced lifestyle that we're very <laughs> familiar with. We'll touch on that in a moment. I, I wanna ask both Carolyn and Linda, um, due to COVID, has design, is design changing for users, hmm. whether it be office or retail? Um, what are you seeing in requests for design or what are you advocating for design so that there can be more space per person in whether it be retail or office? I think, um, uh, so I'll take office first. Uh, um, from an office perspective, you know, the way that offices have been designed recently is um, maybe, uh, and I, I'll talk about for Wells, I did 30 Hudson Yards. We spent a lot of time on workplace and understanding what the ratio of kind of work, the different activities that you do and kind of activity-based working. And so in theory, 70 or 80% of the space is actually designed for individual heads down work. There's private offices, there's workstations and about 30%, 20% of the space is designed for collaborative activities. So conference rooms um, or other sorts of rooms like that. And I think you'll see that start to flip almost completely on its head. Um, and because people now can figure it out to do we're not going to come to the office to sit on Zoom calls or do one-on-one -on -one work or just focused work. They might just do that at home. And if they're coming to the office, it's really so that they can collaborate. And so we're starting to see things really be designed with a lot more flexibility and a lot more um, capability to support gatherings at a socially distanced um, way. And then for retail, we're seeing a lot more about experiential retail, where um, because retailers now need to compete with online retailers, and it's very difficult, that's been a trend for a long time before COVID. Um, right now, if people are going to go into a store, it's really about experiencing something that they can't do online or get online. And they might even still order the goods online or have it shipped to their house. But if they come into a store, we're really seeing it be about kind of what kind of experience they're having in that space. Yeah, I'd agree. I see um, more so from a construction point of view, the clients are starting to introduce a lot of um, sanitary uh, stations and the all the fixtures in the bathrooms are starting to be handsless or touchless. You don't have to touch anything really. Those are the design changes that I've seen for the most part. Um, 
and uh, incorporating UV ray technology into some of the design aspects has been, uh, I've seen that happen over the course of time as well. Um, from an experiential point of view for the observation deck, um, I know there's been a lot of consideration on the experience of the viewers. So keeping a distance in the queue line, the queue lines tend to be a little longer now just to allow for that type of spacing in between people. Um, being that this all has happened over the last year and we're in the middle of, uh, we were in the design phase for the last year, all of those items have come into play. I also think just thinking out loud and thinking for future, um, I would imagine office spaces might revert back to having operable windows as opposed to a curtain wall system that we see so often now. I think the operable window idea was a thing that you could see in, in buildings of, that were built in 1940, 1950. And then towards the 2000s, they were starting to introduce curtain walls that, that do not allow the users to really open or close their windows. And I, I think there's gonna be a comeback there. That's just me projecting, I think. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Um, all right. Um, can you tell us briefly uh, about your leadership journey and the key factors you believe are the cornerstones to becoming a, a leader, specifically a woman leader in commercial um, real estate industry? Hi, um, I'll, I'll start here. I, I'll just keep it short so that, um, you know, we don't bump against each other. I know that some of us probably have the same tips and tricks for this, but I would say one of the most important things is um, being about being a leader, being a woman in this industry is to just go ahead and be a woman and own your femininity. And it's okay because women bring to the table qualities and traits that are different than a man brings to the table. But in construction, there's like this tendency sometimes women feel like they need to behave like a man or not appear feminine. And it's like, I don't think that that's necessary. And the reason for that is really because to me at the core, the most important thing, one of the most important things about leadership is gaining trust from people. In order to do that, it's about being authentic. So in order for authenticity, you just need to own who you actually are. And um, all of your you know, things about emotions, yes, these need to be guided by logic. You know, you need to be rooted in logic. You still need to be strategic. You need to have all the leadership qualities and traits that everyone else has to be successful. But I think being authentic and just being who you are and owning that is perfectly fine. <laughs> I like that. I'm gonna jump in. I think number one, you be yourself. Okay. And if you want to be someone else, it's just not going to work. And, you know, also, you know, sales is no longer a boys club. So sometimes I don't understand why questions are, you know, as a woman in sales or in commercial real estate, you know, how are you going to navigate? We shouldn't be navigating any differently than anyone else. So I think you should, I think everyone, man or woman, you should have confidence, right? You should have curiosity. And you should be able to have conversation. And those three C's will get you through, like, you know, who you are and where you want to go. Um, women are very good with curiosity. Women like to converse. We like to engage. Uh, the confidence comes with experience and you can't be afraid. Um, you know, the role of confidence, you can't, like, you can't, like, discount that. As we engage with customers, business has changed. You need to have meaningful conversations and you need to think about critical ways in which you could help them think out of the box, especially now. Um, those blanket answers are no longer going to work. I like that three C's thing. That's very good. I like that too. And I think that um, it's important for us as leaders and, and becoming leaders to make sure that everyone has a voice at the table. Um, and I agree with you, Patricia, on that, how does it feel to be a woman? Sometimes I think that they think we're aardvarks, but, you know, <laughs> women have been in business for centuries, you know, our mothers were, were, in, were in, uh, executives. It's, this is not new. I think we're just, there are more and more of us. Um, and I think it's important to instill the confidence for those younger people to have a voice at the table, not be afraid to say something. When I worked uh, in government, the first thing that Dr. Kissinger said to me was, the stupid question is the one that you don't ask. So I think one of the things that I learned from that, and I was in my early 20s, was mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Everyone has a question, and every question has an answer. So I think that, as you said, fear, don't be afraid. You, fear is something that we need to let them know. There's, you're equal 
table to everybody else. And I think another thing that helped me was I took a lot of courses. If I didn't know something, I would go online and, and try to navigate what that was and learn as much as I could about it. And I think learning is power, knowledge is power. And that's something that we all should keep empowering these young ladies with. I agree with that. I um <clears throat> I grew up in a household with three brothers and my nephew, my father, a lot of really strong male figures in my life. Um, the the industry that I'm in is still very male dominated for the most part in construction, but I have to say like that my my mentors through my whole career have been men and they've been wonderful and they've taught me the same thing like, you know, just be yourself. You you bring so many different assets to the table, and one of them is this my um, my way of communicating with people in the field. I just have a little bit of a softer mm -hmm. touch that you know maybe your typical that's male fair. super might not have, and that's just that's just the way it is. Sometimes you just uh, women have a different way of speaking to people sometimes, and that's just natural. Um, and I think it's okay. It, I, I agree with everything across the board. It's okay to just own what you own. And sometimes you might do your job better than anyone else, male or woman, in your in your um, office. Um, and sometimes you can learn from other people in your office. So I think to be a leader, you just have to be a team player. And regardless of the gender or anything else, just be a team player. And also um, realize that moving forward you whatever you have is to be shared with everybody else in your team too so if there's other young women in your team like it's important to instill in them because maybe like I, I always think to myself like i i'm pretty strong i had to grow up around a bunch of boys <laughs> when i was a kid so now i feel like if i have a team player maybe is a little more shy i could tell her like no don't worry about it this is how you handle that certain situation and don't be shy about it just bring what you have to the table believe in yourself and know that you have something special. Great. Um, there's much talk today about the hot button issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, can you describe briefly, you know, what this means to you in in your firm today? Um, is it there? Maybe it's not there. Um, you don't want to brag about that if it's not. But um, uh, tell us how it's taking place because much has changed over the last six months. Oh, at Cushman and Wakefield for the last 10 years, we've had a heightened focus on the on uh, diversity and inclusion. And in the last five years, we find it's most important to gain diverse perspectives as well as to have diverse ideas and understand our clients, consumers. One of the things we have, we have a new female COO, Michelle McKay, and we have at least eight employee resource groups. We also have a new direct, we hired a new director of diversity um, who's leading this. We have WIN, which is Women's Integrated Network, HOLA, Hispanic and Latin, <clears throat> excuse me, Advancement, Aspire, Asian and Pacific Islanders, BUILD, Blacks United in Leadership and Development, and UNITY, which is the LGBT integrate, Q Integrated Network for veterans programs, parenting programs, and more. So we have Cushman and Wakefield over the past, I would say at least two, three years that I've been there, has created these new groups and has built on the groups that exist. And I don't. I think that this is one company who's really spread their wings. I also represent Starbucks, who has inclusion, Nominal. diversity. I mean, mm -hmm. I can just tell you they're yep. probably number one on the hit parade. Um, and I represent Chipotle. I've been with them for 12 years and they have always been inclusive. Everything that they do is inclusive and diverse. Um, There's so many programs for their employees. Um, employees and clients are the most important thing to both these customer uh, clients. And I think that they're on the forefront of a lot of these changes. Hey, um, I think from my view, um, so we get to interact with a lot of different companies and clients. And um, so some of the, the things that have happened kind of in the USA, but now globally um, with the social unrest and the injustices that, that have come to light um, have caused these conversations to come to the forefront. And, um, and so while these things are very negative and hard to, 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 to see, and live through, there's been some positivity because it's sort of been an awakening for people and that's good. I mean, nearly every RFP that we get in the door now from our big clients, big companies, you know, Uber, Google's, everyone um, has a component of diversity in it. You know, tell us about your company. What are you doing about DNI? What's important to you? And so um, for me and for, for us here, diversity is a lot about, to Diana's point, just 
people around the table that think about things in different ways. That's all it is. And so out of that, naturally, you'll, you'll have socioeconomic diversity, you'll have gender, you'll have ethnicity that's diverse, um, but it's a really important thing for us. And so, um, you know, we, we do different types of programs. We take interns in from programs like Year Up, you know, that allows us to have socio socioeconomic um, diversity, but also provides an opportunity for those students and kids who kind of need access to corporate America and wouldn't otherwise have it. Um, but then even in our hiring practices and also in how we are developing talent and promoting people through um, and it's important that our, our staff, our own staff, is a reflection of the communities that we serve in and work in. Mm -hmm. And also, clients are starting, like I said, to find this to be an incredibly important thing, important thing for them. So, um, all of this, in my opinion, is, is a very good thing. It's, it's very helpful. And so I think the, the key is just to be intentional about it. It doesn't just naturally happen. You have to really kind of set goal, goals and targets and strategies to achieve it. And I think um, that's kind of what we're doing in our company, but we're seeing a lot of our clients shift their focus there too. So I work for a publicly traded company and um, I started with Newmark when we were private and I don't think it was probably as diverse as it's grown into what it is today. And I think through awareness and experience and what's going on in the world, I think all the companies have taken a position to step up and open their eyes and just be more inclusive. Um, I think it's kind of boring to sit around a table when everyone looks the same and sounds the same. So uh -huh. I think we've operated like that for way too long. And I think now we're just getting a better blend of talent. And, you know, it's not a bad thing. You need that to grow. It's just what's going on globally. And the companies that don't acknowledge it and who don't have a platform to institute change, they're going to be left in, in the background. Excellent point. I agree with that too. I think at, at a competition, um, we have so many great outlets and networks. One of them is the women's network. And um, we come to events like this, we share events like this. Um, I also think what's really important too, especially I feel it from our perspective is just that feeling of family. Um, it goes from project to project, but there's always gonna be a crossover. Um, our, our business is big, but it's still small enough to feel like family. People that you work with will always ask about you, ask about how you're doing specifically. And then that makes you feel like you're just one family, regardless of like every different walk of life that we're all from. And so we're so diverse in so many ways. Um, and it's nice to have that and share that in the office with the rest of our coworkers. Um, but we do, have, we do have a lot of different outlets with our company as well. Um, and it's just constantly shared throughout the board. And one nice thing too that AECOM does is they highlight people throughout the months with the newsletter. And it kind of lets us know when what's going on on the other side of the world with all of our other, with our other projects and who our talent really are. So it's kind of, it's great. Fantastic. It is 11.05, we're gonna end in just a minute. I got a text from Robert Withers from M1 Capital who is now at his destination, he said, uh, thank you very much to the panelists, and uh, he appreciates um, being able to sponsor the event today. So final question, one word answer, one word. John, John let me is... just interject for a second because we go to 1130. <laughs> so we could at least ask them two more questions and then we'll leave some questions for the audience. So we'll or stop two. at 1115. Oh, we can answer with three words. You sure can. <laughs> How would you describe yourself in one word? Professionally. Driven. What was that? Driven. Is problem solver one word technically? Well, hyphenated. <laughs> I'd say driven and self motivated. Um, I'd say I'm an uplifter. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. 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 So moving on, then let's let's pivot towards politics. There's just a national election. Things are going to change. Um, within New York City, uh, the current administration has not been a friend to real estate. Um, what do you think politically is going to happen as I, I believe the mayoralty is up at the end of next year, a new mayor will take office January 1, 2022, so roughly 12 and a half months from now, um, but on a national basis. So let's, let's 
compare, you know, locally New York City, because even though some of us do business in Westchester, New York City drives the bus for us. So um, what what do you think happens politically? How does politi politics and real estate are certainly intersected? How do you think the change in uh, policy will affect real estate moving forward? I'll be happy to start. I'll take more of um, the, the uh, presidential administration, the change there. We've really been studying a lot about um, the jobs and economy package under the Biden-Harris plan that's pretty robustly described in their website, um, as well as climate, actually. There's a lot of money that's going to be invested in both infrastructure in the country, as well as the, the climate plan. And the reason that the climate impacts real estate is because, you know, there's some parts of that plan that involve things like building some of those wind turbines. Uh, there's a lot of construction involved in those climate plans. Um, and we're really looking forward to that. Um, and, and back on the infrastructure side, um, New York City has really suffered any big city that has a heavy reliance upon mass transit. Those dollars have just dissipated and disappeared from their budgets. And they have a lot of assets that they need to manage. But people like the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey um, and the Mass Transit Authority and others, they, they do a lot of work and spend a lot of money. And so we're looking forward to kind of um, the investments that are planned um, at the federal level from an infrastructure perspective and, and also from the renewables, um, the things that are being done like in California, but that are gonna come to the East Coast around um, electric vehicles, charging station, all of that requires a lot of construction as well. And then finally in New York City, we're looking forward to the implementation of um, some of the local laws that impact um, sort of electricity and kind of building systems and the HVAC systems that will require some work as well. So we think that things will look up from our from our perspective with the change of political climate. Anybody else want to talk about it? It's tough to project really without, I mean, it's it's a tough, it's like kind of a, a tough question. It's just really hard to know what the future holds, but I think um, sort of uh, resonating off of what Linda mentioned, it's I, there are a lot of changes uh, scheduled from a climate point of view, which I think will impact the world as, in a different type of way. Also don't know with um, you know the changes in the education system, with students remotely learning or with people remotely working, what does that really mean for our economy? Um, so it's all intertwined and it's all gonna evolve over the next couple of months. But again, like I think it's always good to have a positive outlook and also just see, um, you know, there's a lot of private investors too that are still going to be wanting to build in the city. Um, so I think there's, it, it's kind of, it's kind of tough to project. But like everything, we just go with the flow and we have to look, be positive about it, and make sure that, uh, you know, we're just continuing to be positive. Great. Um, what? Do you see as emerging trends in the industry right now? Um, one or two, if everybody wants to throw one or two out there, what are some of the emerging trends you're seeing right now? Um, for us, I'm gonna say sustainability. Uh, has been around for a while, has been important, but it's, it's taking on a renewed focus. Um, and the reason, the reason I think it is, is because um, some of the companies that have been hit fairly hard by the pandemic and the change in the economy, um, some of their real estate departments have had to go into, you know, what we term as cash conservation mode. And so they've slowed on their spending, they've slowed on capital, capital spending. Um, but where they have continued to invest is around the sustainability and kind of meeting their carbon neutral goals. Um, some of those come to light in 2020, some in 2025. And so they still are investing in that segment. So, so uh, sustainability is still a big trend that we're seeing. I see a trend in startups and, and technology. You know, a lot of people in private equity are spinning off. I have a client who is looking, he's going to be an in, industrial farmer and he's going to grow uh, crops vertically in a warehouse. So, you know, people are thinking out of the box now um, and just going into, you know, more of organic uh businesses. I agree with that. I've seen a lot of new technologies emerge. Um, a lot of security technologies are also emerging. I've noticed that um, over time uh, with different ways of people checking into spaces, uh, different ways of people going through turnstiles and uh, cameras, camera, like new camera uh, gadgets that are being proposed for all these new jobs. Um, and 
and data logging, but I also noticed too, like features. Lately, I've been noticing maybe because I'm working on the observation deck, but I've noticed a lot of features, like uh, things that people want to see. There's a big movement in the art world where sculptors and all these artists are really starting to get their work into the city and into corporate spaces. And that, that one's huge. I, I, and I love that one. That one I think is dear to me because I like to see um, the artists really get their work out there and and um, and people appreciate it too. Cause you know, it comes, it's, it's nice to see that especially in an office building where you're working on a lobby and you introduce an art feature and it's just, it, it, gives, it gives sort of like a feeling of warmth to the, to the visitor. I've seen a lot of that lately. Uh, one last one I'll add is in the construction field, we're seeing a trend towards prefabs. And um, so with uh, with social distancing that's required on the job site, there's less that can be done in the field with uh, sort of with pace, with speed. And so the trend to prefab has been around forever, but the, the trend to do more in a factory in a control setting and send it out to the site ready to go is really, especially in the hospitality sector, like hotel rooms are completely assembled. The rough-ins are in place. They just kind of crane it in each room itself. So I think that's another trend that we're seeing um, that I think will continue. Diana, anything on trends? Um, I'm seeing a lot of um, technology changes, like in the health and beauty industry. Um, you can't go in and try on lipsticks, and you can't, you know, talk really interact too much with someone at a makeup counter or in the drugstore. So there's a lot of that. Um, you know, they can put makeup on you and uh, you know, on a computer. Um, and I think there's a lot of that going on with with even in fashion where. Most people don't want to go into dressing rooms, so they're going into stores, buying things, bringing them home. A lot of back and forth. So there's a lot of that virtual trying on, a lot of virtual health and beauty. And I see a lot of that continuing, which I think is great because there are some people that just can't get out. You know, there's a lot of disabled people that really, you know, that's a sector that really hasn't been paid attention to. And I see a lot of that being really super helpful for them. And it's very inclusive, of course. Can you tell us professionally about one of your biggest challenges or a challenge that you, you faced and how you um, adapted and, and turned it around? I, was a, I had a partner um, for 11 years when I was back at Winnick and um, we, did the, we did all of the business together. Everything we did together, we were you know, we separated to go on meetings and, and different things and showings and, and client client tours. Well, he died in 16 days unexpectedly from MRSA oh, wow. uh, at the hospital. And so my, not only was my, you know, my world turned upside down because we were also friends. You know, we both came from similar backgrounds. We both were single parents. Um, so, and I was with him through the time that he passed away. So it was emotionally and, um, it was emotionally devastating and it devastated me in terms of my business. What I did with it was I took the focus off of feeling of my feelings and I just flipped the switch and put everything I had into maintaining the balance of my clients and my company and our family. Um, and I think that was the biggest challenge in my life because it happened so unexpectedly and there was so much so many personal things and business things that he had out there that were he was in the middle of and some of them we were both in the middle and some of them he was just doing on his own um i did have a lot of support from our um from the owner of the company but it was still quite challenging and it took a lot of concentration um and and you know my the sadness of it was something that I just couldn't afford myself to feel. So that took me a few years to refocus on and, and just get past. But I think that was the, probably the biggest pivot in my career. I'll say um, for the younger listeners out there too, one of the biggest challenges that I've ever had to face was passing all the architectural exams to get licensed. Um, it, it's been years ago and it's, a memory I don't want to really remember, but I will say, uh, having having achieved that and having gotten the license, it was also the best thing I could have done. It was extremely challenging. Um, there were 
there were a lot of fails, but there were a lot of passes and um, the ups and downs of the whole process were, were very difficult. I would say that it, it took a lot of time and dedication, um, but having gone through that process for about three to four years, I just kind of got to a point where I was ready to give up and just say, I don't need this license anyway. Like, what, what, what do I need it for? I'm not going to be practicing architecture or whatever. But, you know, I, at the same time, I was like, no, I put too much time and effort into this. I have to finish. Mm -hmm. It's for me and only me. And this is something that I'm going to, I'm going to have to show my kids and my grandkids and people later. And this is what I want for myself. So I just had to saddle up and do it. And looking back on it now, I'm very proud of myself for having done it. It was a big obstacle to overcome, but at the same time, I think um, it was, it was challenging and I'm really glad that like I got past that. And I, and I know a lot of people can relate to it. People that are listening now are probably taking their PE exams or architectural exams or, or whatever it is, your CPAs. Uh, just know that if, you, if there's always a light at the end of the tunnel and you just keep focused on what you want to do and you're going to do it no matter what. And as long as it's your goal, make sure that um, you achieve it. And one word of advice just for everybody out there doing it, like with the new year around the corner, it's really important to make those goals and resolutions. I suggest writing them down, checking in every two to three months to make sure that you're, you're accomplishing what you want. And, and I promise you all your dreams will come true when you keep a goal and a focus and you work towards it. That's correct. I ended up being number one at Winnick for many years. And then when I moved to Cushman and Wakefield, I'm number one in retail as well. So, That's awesome. Get, yeah, I can relate, Carolyn, to the architectural exams. Back when I took them, there were nine of them. It's crazy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I said, um, for me, um, it, it, I don't know if it's the biggest challenge I faced, but the biggest decision, and it was very challenging to make the decision. This has happened to me twice in my career. Is uh, when it was time for me to pivot from my current role into a new role in a new company. Um, at first it was with, when I was with CBRE, I was there for nine years. I was doing great on an amazing trajectory, getting promoted every couple of years. And then comes along my client, our very big client, Wells Fargo Bank, you know, uh, asking me to come over. And I thought, how could I leave CBRE right now? I have these amazing mentors, I'm doing great. And it was so difficult for me to decide to walk out of the door and leave but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to, to help build 30 Hudson Yards and all the other things that Wells Fargo was asking me to do. So I felt that I had no choice and I had to just, um, I, I, the most important thing was I had to recognize that I was afraid, right? Because I was comfortable. I knew people, they knew me, I was doing great there. And so I had to just realize that the fear was still gonna be there. <laughs> Had to make the decision based on something other than the fear, like based on something else. And so the same thing happened to me at Wells Fargo after I was there delivering 30 Hudson Yards and Turner Townsend comes along with this proposition. And it was very difficult for me to make a decision to just walk out when I was doing great in my career. Uh, but I did. And it was really just about um, pivoting and sort of facing the fear, making space for the fear, let the fear hang out. It's there. It's cool. Don't worry. It's okay. But just like deciding, like, I have to think about my future and the skills that I'm going to gain and the impact that I can make from whatever seat I'm in and just do it. So that's my advice. Fantastic. Bravo. I, I think my biggest challenge was I started my career working on the owner side. I had a great salary, great bonuses, great expense account. I had it all. And then I decided, because I thought I had half a brain, to become a broker because I wanted to give myself the opportunity to do better and to make more money and to broaden my horizons. So I went to a pay level of zero. So as you know, as a broker, you eat what you kill. So uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I've never looked back. And it's been a wonderful uh, journey. And I'm still on the journey. And I tell all of you, be true to yourselves. It's very scary, but if you if you can align yourself with a mentor and just give yourself a chance, you know, everyone can do it. Look at Barbara Corcoran. She started her career with a thousand dollar investment. She's a shark now. Now I'm far from being a shark, <laughs> but I love the challenge every day. And you know, I welcome it. And I look at my friends who are still in those positions and their perspective is still where it was when I left. So if I got anything out of it, I got personal growth. Fantastic. Fantastic. Our generation now, you know, our parents worked sometimes at one company for their entire lives yeah. and didn't change. You know, we are changing jobs maybe every decade. Our kids are in the gig economy. They're maybe changing jobs every two to three years. But I think that changing jobs certainly adds to your growth professionally and personally. Um, Absolutely. 
Absolutely. We'll wrap it up with one final question. I see no questions from the audience right now. So one final question. Uh, do any of you have mentees? And if so, um, you know, are they within your company or outside your company or maybe not even in your industry? I do. I have, um, I have numerous mentees. I have some from inside the company. I have some outside the company. I have some outside of my industry. And I also have different age groups. And I have a reverse mentor, which is actually the really coolest thing that I've ever done. Um, because even though I'm not too old in my career, too far, um, I still can learn a lot from, there's a generation in the workforce that's behind me. And um, it, there's so much for them to teach me too. I enjoy menti um, having mentees because for me, I literally learn as much, I get as much out of the relationship as I think that they get. Because even when I'm trying to explain how I've managed through a situation, a lot of times people like the four of us on this panel, you a situation comes up and you just manage through it. You don't necessarily stop the process. Like, how did I do that? Or what did I say? Or what did I do? But when you have a mentee and they ask you, it causes you to really think through it and kind of create a process for yourself around how you might manage through that in the future. So I find it incredibly rewarding. You know, I don't know how you ladies see it, but um, I don't have a mentor or mentee. I am, I feel like I personally mentor so many people and I get so much out of that. And I, and I learn so much out of it. And I think as women, um, women, you know, I hate to stereotype, but I don't think they mentor as much as men mentor men. Cause I think women are very competitive and there's a jealousy factor. So I just try to give them myself to help other women grow within their careers, men and women. I have mentors, um, both men and women and in, in and out of this business. Um, and I always found that when you ask somebody something, we're very myopic when we're going through something, whatever we're doing. It's very helpful to see, hear things from a totally different perspective that you sit back and say, well, I never really looked at it like that it relaxes you and it makes you more confident. And when you enter whatever you're entering into that you needed that for, it gives you a, the ability to sit back, relax, take a deep breath and really talk through it. And I think that level of confidence is what we give to the people that we mentor and what we're receiving on the other end. And I think they used to call them focus groups, Patty. Um, yep. and, that's, <laughs> and now today we're mentors and mentees. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> I, I, agree. I love it. I mentioned earlier, I, I have a lot of um, men mentors and they're, they've all been wonderful. Um, probably, you know, to, to some degree, it could be family. My mother has been a mentor in so many ways, even though she's not in my industry. Um, and sometimes I feel can't relate, but always does relate. Um, and I think that that's important to have. Um, and I also think that it's important to recognize like who those people are that you can go to when you need them. Um, I've mentored many people as well in the past, but one of the best advice that I've gotten from my mentor when I was probably 16 years old was to do informational interviews with people in your office to find out what the rest of them do and see where your, where your journey takes you. So I did that young, at a very young age, I worked in, um, as like a, I was working the front desk, I went to interview with the accountant. I set up an interview with the HR representative. I set up an interview at the time we were working in, I set up an interview with the casting director and I got to learn a lot about what everybody did. And to this day, even like starting my, um, my current project, I didn't know everybody in the office. I kind of, it wasn't an interview, but it was kind of a sit down to get to know what they do and what their role is in, in the job. Not only do you, form a good relationship with them, but you know who to go to for what. And it, it gives you a good idea of what they do on the day to day. And you kind of gain an appreciation for what they bring to the table as well. So I think that was one of the best pieces of advice that I've learned from a mentor. Very good, good advice. <laughs> with that, uh, that's the end of my part of the program. I am going to turn it back over to Teresa. And Teresa, thank you for having me today. 
Oh, we want to thank you, John, for gracing us uh, to be your moderator. You're a natural pro. Uh, we want to thank everyone, our audience and our guest panelists for giving some valuable insights and your knowledge regarding the commercial marketplace to all of our members and non-members who have joined us. We, For our audience, we want to continue to provide programming that is benefit for your business. And we wish everyone wellness and safety and have a healthy, happy and prosperous new year for 2021. Please save the date for our next Zoom webinar is scheduled for January the 14th of 2021 from 10 to 1130 a.m. Your Passport to the Caribbean Islands, a commercial real estate conversation with the U.S. Virgin Islands. For everyone, be well, be safe, and thank you so much for this. You are a league of extraordinary women. We thank you. Happy holidays. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Happy, Happy holidays to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye.